Colleen gets to study things like the mind of James Madison, which uh, seen from different lights is like a perfect crystal goblet with many facets and throwing off many pretty kinds of light. The business I'm in is studying things like the magazine of Dubique called Dubique from Isis, which is sort of like studying the cement floor of uh, battlefield surgery. Much less pleasant, much less ennobling, but I think it's important. So I undertook a project to try to understand more about the kinds of technologies of communication these groups are using. And I commenced work on a book. Uh, this is the first time I've ever presented the findings in my book. I hope that's interesting to you, but it will have one or two problems with it. I will have to use a text, and you'll see a few mistakes in the slides that didn't get worked out in the transition between a Macintosh and other computer systems, so I owe you a, an apology for that. My subject is terrorism, uh, and that means it's about power. Terrorism is about power, but it's also a perverse form of communication, because to succeed, terrorists have to put their views forcefully in front of the public. They have to tell you what their ideals and their goals are. They have to address multiple audiences, including internal membership. And without those ideas or those messages, then their acts really become barren, like the clanging of a gong, which announces absolutely nothing. So terrorists make arguments, and thus the, the title I'm working with, with my co-author, Randy Bodish. Terrorists make arguments, and I learned a long time ago with people like Bill Rood, who had me read Mein Kampf, to take arguments of extremists very seriously and to try to study them. The man named Abdel Hamid Abaud, <coughs> he didn't just turn up in Brussels in November and run that mass murder operation nearby in Paris. He actually had been around for a while. He'd been in Europe. He went back to Syria with his friends in ISIS. He gave an interview to the magazine Dabiq in February of 15. That interview was published, and yet that man was then able to get back into Europe, make it up to Brussels, and do what he did. This is the sort of, this is the sort of primary source in open source intelligence that Harold Rood taught us all to take seriously. And regrettably, in this case, this man was not watched for. There's an astounding variety, really, in different kinds of media that terrorists use in their strategic communications. I can only try to cover seven of them. You can ask me about a lot more. You already know more than I ever will about, say, social media, which the, some terror groups are extremely good at. What I'm going to talk about are seven, starting with radio, the newspaper, speech making, television, the book, the internet magazine, and uh, the advertisement. And so my first slide is Franz Fanon. And uh, in older days, he was much studied, and now he's a little bit forgotten. And that's one reason I bring him to your attention. And I've identified him with the subject of radio. Fanon was a brilliant, brilliant man. I've spent a lot of time trying to learn from his books and learn about his life. Uh, he's a great symbol of the Algerian National Liberation Front, but he wasn't Algerian. He was from Martinique, and ironically then, a French citizen. In fact, he was such an interesting man, he was once decorated during World War II by a military man who would later wanted to have his head uh, in, in because of his involvements in Algeria. Now, the FLN, for whom he was an advocate, won in 1962. FLN was socialist and nationalist. They were not the sort of modern jihadis you might have read about, and I'll talk a few, a little about some of those later. In 1954, they did something very bold and very simple. They laid down a well-conceived eight-point plan. They announced this is what the National Liberation Front in Algeria is fighting for, and we're not quitting until we get these things. Hundreds of thousands of people 
were involved in the subsequent war. At one time, France had half a million men in Algeria. But FLN won. They beat the French. The nationalist uh, and uh, ideology of this group for which he worked had an internationalist flair. They liked guys like Fanon who might come in from the outside and make their case for them. It was good politics to have a man from Martinique and a French citizen and a brilliant doctor involved in their war. They also thought about formal diplomacy and he pulled a tour of two in Africa. The diplomacy by the FLN was so impressive that in 02, Oxford University Press published a book about it that big, called A Diplomatic Revolution. It was impressive, and they understood media of lots of other kinds too, not just diplomacy, not just um, the face of a good advocate. They used radio. And the essay that Fanon wrote about FLN use of radio attracted my attention because it's been forgotten. It was called The Voice of Free Algeria. Radio was a brand new technology in the post-war world, especially for Africans. But you can imagine the power that it had at the time. Now, we were all raised on stories, weren't we, of Franklin Delano Roosevelt broadcasting and the family huddled around the big old set from General Electric or something, dog in the corner, everybody intensively listening, the way that there was a sort of a, a mystical power in which words and musics would, would, would float on the air. Uh, we know that. The, F, the FDR Memorial in Washington shows us the scene. Well, France had dominated radio. It was a cultural weapon of sorts. It was an educator, but it was also in the service of France as the controlling power of all of the Maghreb. And so what FLN learned in this man's day was to take that same tool and turn it against them. FLN learned to put together mobile transmitters, keep those hidden, to circulate enough transistors so people could listen, and to try to, in that way, create a counter power to France, and they succeeded. And what captivated Franz Fanon was the way in which this technology became, uh, what had been a, a tool of imperialism became a tool for the FLN underground. And even though broadcasts were spotty, and even though there were irregularities in it all, there was a kind of power that this new medium had. It was able to reach Algerians. It could reach into the pocket of the gorilla out in the desert. It could reach into a cafe radio where many villagers would gather around and listen closely. That's why he called his, this the, the voice of free Algeria. Now his influence was, many ways, was in many ways written. He certainly didn't broadcast for FLN radio. He just wrote that essay about it. He did write for El Mujahid, the paper that the FLN published, which was an outstanding, very good paper, very thorough, very serious. Not much remains of it. The Yugoslav state, which was friendly to the Algerian revolution, once published a compendium of it, which I haven't seen. But you can still read many issues of El Mujahid. It was good, and he helped write for it. And what that magazine did, and what his Wretched of the Earth book and the Toward an African Revolution, in which the essay appears, was contribute to a sense that violence was a credible alternative to colonialism. Colonialism was not likely to be defeated by good intentions, and violence was necessary, and in fact, more than just a kind of guerrilla war or insurgency was necessary. There are quotations one can find in Fanon which speak for violence with its redemptive value psychologically and politically and which have no constraints on it. That is, a gorilla could be inspired by it, so could a terrorist willing to inflict indiscriminate damage in a cafe. And if you want to see a great movie, The Battle of Algiers is still a great movie and it'll show you just how the FLN used terror. And this kind of violence was endorsed by proponents and Fanon never set himself apart from it. Well, they won, and so they became legendary, and he too. And uh, uh, there were others in the movement that didn't win. 
This is Ferhat Abbas. This is an example of the many Algerians who are genuine nationalists and, yes, Muslims, but who were not extremists and who had real doubts about things like terrorism. He didn't get too much chance to express those, but he was useful to the movement. And he fought with the movement and helped lead it, but he was too moderate. And in the end, they shouldered him aside and they went back with the more extreme types. Nonetheless, what this legacy was after 1962 was a couple of things. One is that you could throw off a country even as strong as France with a seat in NATO and a seat on the UN Security Council that if you were willing to use politics and guerrilla war and terrorism, you had enough shock, enough ideas, enough political power transmitted to make you viable. And so they won the war and there was tremendous interest in them afterwards. Radio really becomes almost a standard for insurgent groups. There's a book about it by Lawrence Soley, S-O-L-E-Y, uh, which is a very interesting book. And others also decided that, that, that uh, radio was truly a good weapon, a good weapon of culture, of education, of propaganda. Not too long ago, the TTP, the, uh, the Pakistani Taliban, lost a leader. The new man, guess what his name is? It's called Mullah Radio because he was famous not only for posing on the back of a white horse and other such things, but he was also famous for broadcasts hour upon hour uh, to people over the medium of radio. ISIS too has some radio. This is their magazine De Beek. There's an ad for Abiyan Radio, which I've not yet had the chance to study closely, but Many groups use this kind of communication. Well, there's radio and there's also the good old fashioned newspaper. This is one that uh, proponents of Irish rebellion used. The Irish Republican Army, which is in distant, distant ways associated with what things all say, can be dated back centuries or more traditionally 1916 or some period during World War I when they emerged. And it was in fighting for an independence from England and for unification of all of the island, which was never achieved again, uh, that people like Michael Collins and James Connolly and <coughs> De Valera all became famous. They emphasized guerrilla war sometimes in some phases of their history. They always emphasized politics. They sometimes emphasized terrorism. They were very good at economic sabotage, long before Al-Qaeda considered that they might beat the U.S. economically, which is probably a mistake. IRA thought they could beat the British Empire with economic war. One of the archetypes of their effort was print media. So they made little magazines and they made newspapers and proponents made newspapers. They had their own paper on faux black or Republican news. And this is a sort of a distant offshoot made by Americans uh, in, in New York City. That's an old copy and there's a, young, a newer one from 1994. I subscribed for 10 years. It was absolutely fascinating. This sort of paper is a political tool but it's also a money maker and lots of other things. It's a multifaceted political instrument. Uh, the Irish people started in the early 70s and it only ceased publication uh, a few months after 9-11. This is an example of so-called war news uh, from 1992. You can see production values are kind of second rate and photographs and print can be murky, uh, but it's good enough. It's good enough to purvey the sense of culture and history and politics and you, sometimes there were language lessons for Gaelic. Um, they'd give you warnings about infiltrators into the Irish movement. Uh, there might be a story on music, uh, Irish music. Um, commemorations were always a big thing. They loved, uh, they loved remembering dates and telling you why, why they mattered and they liked reporting on the war. There's one of their political uh, headers it shows you, the article would show you, had you the time, uh, an interest in whether or not peace talks would still be viable or whether it's only going to be the Armalite or the rifle, the, the grenade. On the right, a house painting, a very famous method they used from time to time to spread their, their word. Uh, and the paper ranged on. This is an example of some of their commercial efforts. 
because you could not only advertise your politics, you could sell stuff and you could make money. And so NORAID, the American version of the unit that, that worked this paper and was its birth, was interested in raising funds for their own efforts so that people like me who got the paper could also get advertisements for meetings that I might join or, that, uh, or videos and such that, that I might buy. Uh, so here we have uh, a variety of, viol of uh, things about uh, violence, in this case war, uh, and, and uh, items of the video type that would purvey a sense of what they were doing. Um, the most interesting thing I ever bought from them was a t-shirt. They sold those too, with the face of Jerry Adams or the face of some hero like Wolf Tone. This one was unusual. It, it advertised the liaison between FARC guerrillas and IRA members. At the time, the Irish Republican Army had found, was found to have three people in Colombia working with the FARC guerrillas. They were trading information on bomb making. Uh, and uh, the shirt dared to celebrate this kind of liaison even though uh, the three guerrillas were in jail at the time. They got away, by the way. They were released and no, nobody's found most of them. The influence of this kind of thing is very important because you've got a chance to create a community with a newspaper. This goes back as far as I know in the terrorism world to the anarchists in our country. In the late 19th century there were many, many anarchist newspapers right here in the U.S. They didn't often run very long. They might have rather bad, uh, bad production values but they were something. Uh, Lenin, for his part, created a newspaper. It was called Spark. Lenin said, you have not only the way you push your politics, you have the community you create, a kind of invisible clandestine community involved in researching and writing and publishing the paper, selling it on the street, which is a chance to make contacts. Uh, and so Spark to him was a very interesting kind of logistical tool and not just a purveyor of, of politics. Uh, there were lots of others who took, uh, who took to that, and so there was a newspaper uh, or two that the American weathermen had, for example, in the early 1970s. Uh, one of them was called A Single Spark, another one was called Breakthrough, another was called Groundswell. Their most important political document, 1974, the weathermen called A Single Spark Can Start a Prairie Fire. That's a Maoist slogan that they liked. So the notion that you're creating a community, inciting it to action, and all the rest was uh, a way to move a newspaper. At the end of the 1960s, Philippine communism renewed itself. It had been a part of Philippine life throughout the 20th century. It was a major uprising in the area of the 1930s, for example. 1940s and 50s, the Huck Balahap Revolution, very important, put down by President Ramon Magsaysay. In 68-9, a new party's founded, Maoist, like those guys who loved, uh, who loved Mao and the Weathermen. And Sison got together uh, with uh, one or two older people, but mostly younger student types. And he refounded communism in his country under the direct impulse of Mao, who he believed was the voice of the future. He was a smart man. I showed you one of those already. There are a lot of them in the terrorist world. He was a professor of English literature. Never underestimate the leaders of these groups. If you're interested in Peru, Abumail Guzman had two doctorates before he ended up in jail because of what he did. There are many, many leaders in this uh, underground world that have very high degrees. And by the way, those are very useful in helping them craft their propaganda. So Sison, the lit man and the Maoist, caused in Peru, in, in, in the Philippines, a kind of insurgency like they were doing in Peru, like they had done in China, like they were trying to do in Indochina, in which power rose out of the peasantry Peasants were better organized. You didn't depend upon the labor union types in factories because there weren't so many factories. But you were able to rally people in the countryside and produce a revolution. Uh, he's been trying ever since. He's still the titular head 
of the New People's Army and the Communist Party of the Philippines. He built the party and he's been at its lead. NPA grew. The Philippines is profoundly troubled. Their politics are sometimes corrupt. Their division of wealth is very unequal. It's a scandal for some Filipinos. Uh, you know that. There are other issues. They claim that uh, the neo-imperialism threat is always present. And isn't it interesting now that U.S. forces largely left the country, but under Chinese threat, the Filipino government has asked for more visits, more access to bases uh, than is usual. So even now, you can make a good argument against neo-imperialism. So NPA grew. It grew especially under the time of Marcos, the dictator Ferdinand Marcos. And similarly, when you had good governance under Corazon Aquino, uh, it, it diminished. The numbers fell off. There's probably no more than about 4,000 now. I tried to map once where they are, and they're not where you'd expect. The Huck-Balahap Rebellion I spoke of very briefly happens all the way up here in Luzon. But much of the Red Forces now are scattered in places we don't really think of, especially Mindanao, which we only associate with the Moros and Abu Sayyaf and the current Bangsamoro peace effort and all the rest. But actually, the New People's Army, the Maoists, have considerable strength down that way. They do the things guerrillas do. This is an example of their training. But this is what I fixed upon, the spoken word. This group, starting with its well-educated leader, Jose Maria Sison, is distinguished by its interest in rhetoric, the spoken word, the song, music. Sison himself makes musical albums, even though he's in exile in Holland, and he sells them worldwide, and his music and songs are known uh, worldwide. And so it's quite interesting to see how the role of the, of the spoken word within what is now one of history, modern history's longest running insurgencies. They take their propaganda seriously. You can pull up these sorts of things anytime on uh, philippinerevolution.net. www.philippinerevolution.net will give you access to their videos, some of their music, long political tracks, statements by Americans who were for uh, the group. Uh, they are kind of uh, troubadours themselves in their own villages because they circulate, making contact with poor people or people they think might help the revolution, trying to persuade political people uh, to change their views. They see themselves as in a continuous process of man-to-man -man propaganda. And that's exactly what Mao told his Chinese to do and they still like that method. And they take the straight Maoist line on everything. Sison still lectures in universities and passes uh, long speeches over various media. It's the straight Maoist line with new interpretations for things uh, that are going on. Uh, he speaks, but down below, all the others do too. They have an education system, quite interesting. I got to talk to a defector once who'd been a principal of their education system. They take ideas and books very seriously. Uh, and they're well read, very serious. They have a, in the New People's Army, a publication called Ang Bayan. Every two weeks it comes out and it's eight pages bring you in any number of Filipino languages or English all the news of the revolution out there in the field. But with the individuals like this, there's a kind of premium on person to person contact. It's nothing like the radio, it's nothing like the newspaper. It's a man or woman or child almost going up to you and making the pitch that the current government is uh, iniquitous or that wealth is badly divided or that the future could be bright or that the threat of uh, fascism or outside occupation is important. They make those arguments and they have to be a true believer to do it. I've got a nice portrait of one of these. It's from Greg Jones. He did a book on the Philippine Revolution. He spent a long time out in the jungle, and he met a young college graduate. He called her Tibbs, was her comradely name. And she was part of what was called an armed propaganda unit. And here's what he says about Tibbs. After 17 years in the countryside as an NPA guerrilla, she bore the signs of great physical hardship. A scar on her neck was the reminder of a goiter operation. 
the legacy of years of poor nutrition. Emaciated, she weighed barely 100 pounds. Ulcers prevented her from drinking coffee and tea and restricted her diet. Her arms were scratched and scarred from long hikes through the Philippine jungles, hands calloused, skins leathery. I met her late one evening in 1987, reading and writing by the dim light of a homemade lamp in a peasant's house in southern Luzon. We met several times thereafter during the course of the year, sometimes remote guerrilla camps, villages, other times in Manila. The intensity, the energy, the sheer exuberance she radiated, whether huddled around a campfire with her comrades singing or sitting in a trendy Manila cafe discussing the latest politics, always amazed me. Despite her physical frailty, Tibbs could walk for hours over rugged trails as nimbly as did the peasants whose lives she had embraced. She was more at home delivering a lecture on the inevitability of communist victory in the Philippines, and she was a fiery speaker, as, as fiery as any rebel I ever encountered. Greg Jones' book is by Westview Press, and it's by no means an indulgent one about the NPA. But boy, that girl got his fancy. He thought he saw something there. Our own orators and our own terror groups could be considered at some length. There's a lot of them. If we go back to our dear friends, the Weathermen, who you've probably forgotten, uh, Billy Ayers wasn't probably much of a talker, although he wrote memoirs. Mark Rudd was a good speaker. Bernadine Dorn, terrific orator. The human voice is a good recruiter, and terror groups know it. And their ability to work one-on-one, -on -one, and that's just how Mark Rudd got recruited, is central to the creation of terror groups and clandestine organizations. On to television. These are cartoon shots from Hezbollah television. You figure that if you've got a gal like Tibbs, you need to spread the word. You know, why not photograph, tape? video, put on television, that kind of powerful advocate for your cause. Capture the face and the gestures and everything else and be able to send it thousands of miles away. Why not uh, television? Well, in the past it was impossibly expensive for most groups, but less so now because of changes in technology. Hezbollah has TV, Almanar TV. Now Hezbollah, of course, is a Lebanese Shiite group they're over 30 years old now. It's kind of hard to remember, but it goes all the way back to days when they were fighting other Lebanese for the shattered suburbs of Beirut. And it goes back to hostage taking, which they did on a massive scale. The party of God today is truly a political force. They do a lot of violence, and some in Iraq. Uh, but they have a dominating influence in the national parliament. They have tremendous credibility politically, culturally, and so forth among Shia in Lebanon. They're a national force. And meanwhile, they still manage to find the time, at least on occasion, to do a foreign terrorist operation. The New York Times just yesterday had yet one more article about what really happened in Buenos Aires in 1994. Boy, that's, that's a long ways from Lebanon. They did a mass murder in Bulgaria a couple of years ago. They've had bomb attempts in Bangkok. So they're deeply embedded in terrorism, but they're deeply embedded in Lebanon and highly legitimate actors. And so they have the time and the money and the, and the uh, capabilities to do something like Almanar TV. This television station started in 1991. They did exactly what you'd expect, a certain amount of religious commentary, political commentary, a certain amount of poking at the enemies like Israel and like some domestic foes. In one case, they did a quite remarkable thing. They put out a, a, a word quietly that caused Israeli defense forces to land at a particular place on the Lebanese coast, but they had Hezbollah guerrillas waiting for them. And so they shot up the assault party. All of it was on film. It was good film, and it ran then in a loop for days and days thereafter as a kind of advertisement for Hezbollah's rise and the fall of the Israeli Defense Forces. So they're clever with their, with their propaganda. 
This particular series of frame shots is from a cartoon. Uh, it's, uh, I chose, there could be many things to work on on Hezbollah's TV. I chose a few things that have to do with children because of the way they, and it's a common thing, the way they politicize uh, children. Uh, they do cartoon figures. We can see here about uh, the uh, top left with a, a reference to uh, stoning. Uh, there are martyrdom images. There's that lovely horse against the sky down there on the lower right. That singular horse, great symbol uh, in many places in uh, Islam. Al-Qaeda loves the, the white horse uh, photograph, a distant, uh, beautiful horizon shot. Even ISIS has used that. Uh, this particular cartoon is a suggestion about why martyrdom is such a precious thing and ought to be strived for. And it's clearly aimed at people of all ages, but it's also aimed at children. Uh, this is a child spokesman. This is Tibbs minus 10 years or 6 or 8. Uh, this in red, white, and green is a fired up little girl uh, who's reciting a screed that obviously someone else wrote. And it says, um, O Muslims, Palestine is calling to you. Jerusalem is calling to you. Beat the drums of jihad, and so forth. Uh, you have slumbered too long. A great line in terrorist advocacy. Uh, Fanon did this. They're always telling you that if you're somnolent or even just inactive, that you've missed the boat of history. You need to get moving. You need to act. Acts triumph over I ideas even. Uh, but you need a combination of both. And of course, that's what ideology is. A combination of ideas that lead directly to certain actions. And so here we're told that we're slumbering too long and it's time to take uh, revenge. This was prompted by one of the many killings of, uh, you've read about, of a leader of Hamas in this case. Um, and uh, uh, it was, uh, it's interesting that Hezbollah often does things that benefit other revolutionary groups it sees in the region. And in this case, uh, a killing of, of a Hamas member prompted it. Um, we have uh, here, just very quickly, I was intrigued in terms of appeal to children, a, uh, a park uh, which Hezbollah has built. You see the twisted uh, tank turret there. Uh, it, it's a park which is designed to give kids a tour around and show them the greatness of of Hezbollah's military people. And we know, of course, from uh, plenty of good news and uh, studies of combat and all, that they have a formidable force. There's no question about it. Um, well, television by Hezbollah um, is one case of a very few in which there's been effort in this area. It's terribly expensive. It can be destroyed. Israel took their studio down once. But it's appealing enough because of all the power that visuals have. Moving pictures, the ability to store this stuff for years at a time, re-edit it, reuse it. That other groups, too, have gone this route. Not all of them can afford their own station. So the PKK you've heard of, the Kurdish Workers' Party, PKK had something called Raj TV where they filmed production spots, and these were shown on other screens, like in Denmark, in Germany. They bought time, as it were, on a station. It was very effective. The problem is that's pretty spotty, and as a viewer, you don't really know when's coming next or where to go to for, the, for, the, uh, for further information. Hamas itself has Al-Aqsa television, the Tamil Tigers, who were destroyed in 2009 after a 40-year war, had television for a while. A reporter I know saw it frequently and said it was pretty good. They had radio, they had print media, but they took the trouble to create television as well. And for some years, the LTTE Tigers had TV. Now, if you don't have any money, what do you do? Because even producing a 20-minute spot about your need for a Kurdish homeland is going to cost you a lot of money. What terrorists do sometimes is use the interview. Just as political figures learn to go to the media, they go themselves. In fact, if they're smart, the media will come to them. Uh, some German neo-Nazis I was studying years ago learned that their antics and costumes and salutes and all were so popular with certain kinds of media in Austria and Germany and the outside that all they had to do was sort of stage a little show 
And they'd not only get the interview and the TV footage, they'd be paid for it by disreputable media outlets. So you can do a filmed interview, which is really quite cerebral and careful, or you can do some other kind of show. Either way, what you've done is successfully put your views, your ideas, onto the screen in front of potentially uh, millions of people. You didn't have to pay for it. It's all for free. And if it draws you public attention that's a bit negative, groups like this think that's fine. And if it draws you some recruits, uh, that's even better. The book. Did you ever think that uh, Muslim terrorists with red hair wrote books? This guy does. Uh, for, my, for my dear neo-Nazi friends, it's an interesting reminder, isn't it, that Anders Breivik became famous for a book he wrote on the web. William Pierce wrote the Turner Diaries, one of the most important things in white supremacy movements in our country. There's a lot of terrorists, actually, that write books. This man is named Abu Musab al-Suri, uh, a code name. The last part of it means the Syrian. He was one of the most intelligent and widely read students of the militant Islamic <coughs> movement in our day. No one knows where he is. I won't even tell you he's alive, because I don't know. He's presumed to be alive. He's a kind of ghost. He's been an incredible influence on Sunni militancy, and therefore he's very important uh, to me or you. Um, there's another photograph with Bin Laden, which is here. I think this is by Peter Bergen. I've never seen it again. This one, oops, we lost our, we lost our, our uh, main screen. Could you tell Patrick the main screen has disappeared? Thank you. I'm sure it's something I touched. We want back that. Um, Al-Suri wrote a book about the Afghans and their fight. And you remember that Taliban at one time controlled 90% of Afghanistan. No small achievement. You see the government controlling that much now? Maybe not. Uh, Taliban was an important force, and it was an important force for the Muslim peoples around the world. So Al-Suri wrote a book which basically accepted most of Taliban's actions and ideas. And he defended them against others in Islam who might be critical. Thank you, Patrick. He wrote another book called The Call to Global Islamic Resistance, and that's the one that I've chosen to talk about today. The Call is 1,600 pages long. It's a veritable history of Islamic militancy. And it's really important in terms of how media is to be handled, whether guerrilla war or terrorism is better here or there how you need to do education of the militant Muslims. He doesn't bother speaking to those who aren't radicalized, by the way. He's addressing himself mostly to those who want to fight. He's also one of the most explicit persons you've ever heard defend terrorism. He uses the word. He uses the term individual jihad terrorism. And Al-Qaeda likes this guy so much that they quote him very frequently or run his articles in their magazine, uh, Inspire. He's not, however, so far as I know, a member of Al-Qaeda. In fact, Al-Zawahiri once said that he is not. Whether we know that or not, uh, Al-Suri, wherever he is, is one of the most influential people around. Because when he wrote this monstrous book, he didn't just leave it published somewhere in a locker or register it with the Library of Congress. He put it on website, and a lot of his buddies put it on their websites. And it began to circulate and create a sensation in the world of very militant people within Sunni Islam. Excerpts were posted here and there, and it became incredibly important on initial and then recirculation. The Al-Qaeda magazine that reprints it is merely one of the many uh, that have done this. He had his own website, too, a very trendy, modern guy. You could download his last book, uh, his ideas on his next book. He did thousands, I don't exaggerate, he did thousands of lectures. Remember that business about the spoken word. So he spent a lot of time in classrooms like this, or smaller, 
or out on the battlefield with a knot of four or five cold people clutching rifles trying to talk about what to do uh, in their next practice assault. He trained at all levels. He's not really a military man, but I mean politically and ideologically. He trained, he trained uh, literally tens of thousands uh, of people. Uh, there's a good biography about him by a, a Norwegian named Leah, if you want to look into him. And there are one or two other ways to access his writings. I think it's useful to think of him uh, as a kind of model in some ways because he's a teacher and a writer and his life is wrapped up in ideas of the jihad. I also, as I say, advise you to keep him in mind uh, the next time some scholar on terrorism tells you that word is so value loaded it doesn't mean anything. And the best proof is no violent group ever uses that word terrorist about themselves. That's wrong. Um, it's wrong a dozen times and he's one of the many who's very proud to talk about uh, terrorism. Um, I have um, some other books I could speak of, including this one, uh, which is about uh, how women can contribute to uh, the Tamil Tiger effort, uh, but I'll skip along to uh, the next slide, which is about Inspire Magazine, since we mentioned them with Al Suri. So these are the guys who love Al Suri, and these are the guys who are fighting with you. These are the guys led by Ayman al Zawahiri. This is the famous first issue, 19, uh, 2010, and we have uh, the most uh, famous headline in uh, radical literature now How to Make a Bomb in the Kitchen of Your Mom. There's also an interview piece, uh, there's some nice inscriptions. Uh, and insp inspire and inspire the believers is up in the header. Uh, we have use of the word here, terrorist, where we're supposed to have great embarrassment about tactics like that. It's boasted on the front page. Uh, and we have some other feature articles and then set sideways uh, the classic bomb recipes which always appear. The magazine specializes in tactical studies and bomb making and a lot of other things. Now, What's interesting is if you're in communications or psych or journalism or something, you don't have to be in terrorism studies, is that Inspire Magazine is aimed directly at you. It's aimed at Americans, and as you know, there have been some Americans who are involved in the writing of it. It's idiomatic English, it's jokey in places, it's uh, euphemistic and, and fun, it's based upon interaction so uh, unlike this lecture, which is painful for some of you right now, because it's all transmission, promise you, you're going to get your chance. Uh, it's interactive. And isn't that what we notice about some kinds of modern media that are web-based, as opposed to the old newspaper I showed you? It's interactive. You get sort of satisfaction going back and forth right away. They publish columns from readers. They publish letters. They ask you for questions about theology, and they try to answer them. Uh, it appears irregularly. It's only been uh, 14 issues, uh, but it's a very fine source for understanding Al-Qaeda and, as I mentioned, for example, something as fundamental to Al-Qaeda as their economic strategy, the strategy of economic damage, which most, uh, which most of us in just reading a paper uh, couldn't pick up. Now, this was a powerful thing, and so Dabiq picked up right at where Inspire left off. ISIS has learned a lot, haven't they? Dangerous for that reason. Very adaptive, very smart. And ISIS looked at this and said, wow, Inspire is just what we need. Dabiq is the name of a tiny town in Syria, and their magazine, Dabiq, is equally important as Inspire. If you think you've been getting too much Western propaganda on this slave girls issue, you can read the original stories in Dabiq, where they'll tell you uh, quite shamelessly, all about the slave markets and what people will bring. Uh, there are many other parts of the story here. There's a blow up of that issue. There's their flag over uh, another part of the story. Uh, there's a lot of interest in this group in openly telling you why women have a particular place in the future caliphate and why that's justified by common sense and especially theology. Now this is uh, the man I spoke of who ran the Paris Massacre. 
So there he is about nine months before he did what he did in Paris, proudly talking about why he was selected by Allah to travel to Europe in order to terrorize the Crusaders. It's a very worthwhile magazine and an important primary source. And now, I think we have some magazine ads that, uh, that I think we're going to pass out, just to have a look. Bill Rood used to like uh, newspapers, so Myra's got a few ads that she's going to pass around. This is my last section. Uh, this is the newspaper advertisement. It's a different thing than printing your own paper, obviously. People's Mujahideen al Kalk, a very important group from the 70s, 80s, 90s, they recently got delisted. And this is how. They're good at politics. They understand ideas. They can cultivate people. They call you up and offer you speaking gigs and money. Uh, they ask for your support. And in this form, uh, they use uh, a newspaper advertisement. PMOI, or MEK, or People's Mujahideen al Kalk is a very mysterious organization in terms of its ideology. But uh, at some times, they appear to be a bit Marxist, and at some times, uh, they had religious strains, not much. They're now basically secular opposition. They're secular opposition to the Mullah's regime. They offer an alternative. Maryam Rajavi's the leader, and she tells you in high-tech ways and low-tech ways all the time why Iran would be a lot better if PMOI was able to run the business uh, in Iran. Now, in the course of their lobbying campaign, they went through many phases of a, white, of a white newspaper advertisement in black and white. They would choose a British or American daily, like the ones coming around, like this one, and they would make protracted arguments about why the regime was evil for the U.S. to pair up with the Iraqi or Iranian regime was inevitably evil too. And they've stayed with this campaign. There's a major phase of it in 05. Some of the papers I'm giving you are from 11 and 10 and 2012. And they make repeated advertisements, but always for variety. There's, they've always have a new take. They've always got a fresh angle. Their PR staff is fabulous. There's a lot of terror groups that can learn a lot of things from this group. Uh, and as I say, they succeeded. They ran these ads until the point came in fall of 2012 when they had not, and this is important, when they had not recently or for some years committed a flagrant terrorist act against us, and where this buildup of advertisements, often involving uh, very prestigious people like those, uh, when this buildup occurred uh, and politics began to change and they had the right sex state in the office, and they were making the right arguments overseas and in America, they su succeeded and got themselves delisted. They'd been on our State Department terrorism list for many years, and they got off. So their success is important. And I think others will study this kind of press campaign with the paid, t or the paid uh, media advertisement and learn just as much as they might have studied uh, from Fanon's essay on radio. Um, when you do this, um, you acquire a certain legitimacy by where you put it, don't you? Imagine the discussions at the Washington Post of whether you take this. They did. They took these ads over and over again. Imagine the delight you feel if severe, staid, conservative Washington is opening the paper and seeing a quarter-page ad or a full-page ad. Uh, it's part of the drive for legitimacy. You make the argument, but it's also about where you place that ad. Um, it's not perfect. It's not interactive. Um, uh, it's, uh, it, it, it doesn't uh, charm anybody who is only looking for pictures. I suppose a lot of people don't read all those ads, right? That's too much text, maybe, for a quick modern reader to study. On the other hand, uh, people say about newspapers that most readers don't finish most of the articles they start anyway. And after all, PMOI, PMOI headquarters gets to, gets to run the whole text. They alone 
get to control the text. Remember when we talked about interviews and we said there's a problem with interviews? Uh, there are advantages to interviews. This is the problem with them uh, because you can't control your text. And so if you do a story with the Washington Post, it may not come out like you want. If you have a thousand pictures taken of your fearless leader and it's beautifully done and the post guy goes away and the photo editor chooses the one that makes him look stupid or wild eyed, you've lost the whole show. When you do this, you control the copy and therefore it's a superior form of ad. And so with that, I'm prepared uh, to discuss a couple quick conclusions and then we go to your, your discussion points. Terrorism's purposeful and it aims at psychological impact as well as intellectual impact. It's trying to intimidate, but it's also trying to communicate. Second, the ideas and arguments advanced in terrorist propaganda matter a good deal. Those who run these organizations, who command the kind of people that do the things you see done, have ideas. They think they're constructive, not merely destructive. They think they're not only attacking, but they're also educating, advocating, leading. They also have, they're in a business whereby politically they have to put their views before the public. Now we know they're sometimes mendacious or deceptive, but ultimately they can't succeed, most of them, if they don't express ideas well. And so all these media you've looked at and 10 more I didn't get to that you're thinking of are all ways for them to show the public their purposes, to make their explanations, to make their arguments, to ask for your vote in one strange way. Third point, most groups have studied this a lot more than we think and a lot more than poli-sci people and communications textbook writers think. They have more than one medium when they run parallel efforts. They have sophisticated appeals that work for different kinds of audiences and they make simultaneous arguments in different kinds of media. The most interesting thing of all I've learned is that something like radio, or something like the newspaper, is rarely given away. As the group goes on and becomes increasingly sophisticated, trying new technologies, it doesn't throw out the old. It carries them on because it confirms that pattern we've found of multiple forms of expression reaching multiple audiences. So I leave it there. You're invited to challenge any of this or ask questions about it. And uh, over to you. Colleen, it's their time.